welcome to the Garden Railway and an exciting moment for us all here on the series because today is the day when the Garden Railway finally begins to look well, like a railway. I mean, don't get me wrong, there's been a lot of hard work involved so far by an awful lot of people, but all we've managed to achieve as yet is something that looks, well, like a road. The next half hour could change your life. Well, at least it'll change your railway. It's a train. Double O, O, G scale, gauge one. 16 mil gauges and scales to a man of very small brain i.e me a very confusing subject indeed but when it comes to laying track a subject you really need to know all about so today i've come here to this wonderful garden and this rather extensive layout to find out all about track laying although there's been miles of it laid already ugh, we're going to be laying a little bit more in the company of today's expert, Mr. Lionel Pike. Now, Lionel is a former teacher who took early retirement to concentrate on his main interest, which, luckily for us, is garden railways. And he is, I suspect, something of an authority on the subject. Is that true, Lionel? Well, a few years of experience now. Now, <clears throat> despite what our esteemed director thinks, I have done some research for this programme, uh, but the most difficult area for me to get my head round has been gauges and scales. I found it very confusing. So, wh where do we start? Well, if you think of railways, the real railway today, that's built to the standard gauge, which right. dates back to the days of George Stevenson in the 19th century. Right. And it's four feet, eight and a half inches. Right. And most modelling, except for narrow gauge modelling, is based upon that fact. Right. So that train over there is a model of a standard gauge train. Yeah, we're looking at a Southern Railway train of the 1960s, and this is modelled in gauge one to a scale of 10 millimetres to the foot. Right. The track it runs on is actually 45 millimetres wide. Right. And it's known as gauge one track. Right. Now, well, let's take it to the other extreme. What's this then? This is M gauge. This is modelling again the standard gauge of four foot eight and a half inches, but right. to a scale of two millimetres to the foot. Right. And runs, as you can see, on a very small track. Right, so it's just a question of learning. This is double O, isn't it? This is what I had as a kid. In fact, this is the train that I had as a kid, as you can see, rather battered. Yeah, that, that, that's, a, that's a four millimetre scale to the foot. Right, that's O gauge. Now, yes. <clears throat> correct me if I'm wrong, but this is the sort of scale and gauge that we would start to see being used in a garden. Is that correct? Uh, yes, it would be. That's, the, the, I think, the smallest, most practical railway to use in the garden. People have used double O. Yeah, but why not extensively? Well, it needs a lot of maintenance. I mean, you see a bit of rubbish like that. Yeah. If you get that on the track, you can see it looks huge yeah. in front of the engine. Yeah. If it falls in front of an O gauge or N gauge, a gauge one train, it yeah. doesn't really matter. Although, I suppose, double O, if you were to use that, you can get some sort of scale distance going if you wanted. Yes, you can. If you have a very small garden and you want to achieve a main line appearance, such as we've achieved here, yeah. then you could go into O gauge or double O gauge. Yeah. Um, again, what will govern the factors is the size of the garden right. and the curves that you, could, you would need for each of the scales and gauges. OK, well, I think I get that. Now, in the real world, of course, there's standard gauge. There's also narrow gauge and broad gauge. And I think the confusion for me is when we translate those different gauges back into, into scale models? Yes. Uh, you see, that model, that one, that one, that one, and indeed that, all model the standard gauge, four right. foot eight and a half, and the locomotive on the table. Right. This model here yeah. is modelling the narrow gauge. Now that is to a scale of 1 to 22.5, and that engine is representing a locomotive running on the narrow gauge, one metre wide. So, Lyle, down to a bit of nitty-gritty and to actual track laying. The first thing I have noticed here is you've forgotten, I suspect, to put any ballast down. No, we deliberately didn't put any ballast on this railway at all for maintenance reasons. Um, this is roofing felt. Right. As you can see, we're in a wood. 
there's a lot of debris falling. Yeah. You get garden debris out there. Yeah. It's a few minutes job to blow the debris off with an air blower. Uh, this is using one of those massive... Yeah. Uh, yeah. You can't do that with ballast. It'll go in the points. Well, what, what is ballast? I mean, why do they use ballast well, on real railways? Because it's used to actually hold the track on a real railway. The ballast is tamped in around the sleepers and prevents the track sliding and moving sideways, hopefully. Right. And, so that uh, is quite jagged then and locks Yes, it together. is. It's, and it locks and it binds. It's a binding agent. Whereas in a model railway like this, this is a reasonable representation of the colour of ballast. Yeah. But it's maintenance friendly. Well, right. And it's put on with a ga gas torch. Right. propane torch so that the backing is actually melted by the flame as it goes down and then is rolled with a steel roller to get a nice finish surface finish right so now here we're putting in a bit of a passing loop would that be right is there a station going to be yes here? this is going to be developed as a country station there'll be a passing loop here and a small siding up there and another small siding at that end okay. and lots of buildings right so let's have a go at this then now can i tap this in here with that be uh 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 uh, uh, no, I don't think we can because if I put that truck on there yeah. and I move this one, yeah. they're going to touch, see? So we've got to decide on the width between the tracks. On the real railway, this is six feet. Yeah. So that should be 60 millimetres right. on our scale. Yeah. But because we're going to run G-scale trains on here, which are a lot wider, right. like the little black engine we saw earlier, then we decided we would compromise yeah. And we'd push the tracks out with these trammels to a standard distance. All right, pass this one down. You pass that one on and thread that on. And you've just measured these out, have you? They've all been accurately measured to the clearance we decided would be the clearance for the whole railway. Yeah. So all the track on the railway, yeah. including the point work. Now, having got that there, yeah. you see the railway, the track is bending because yeah. it's very flexible. Yeah. So we bring a straight edge up tight against it and we pull with our thumb and forefinger the track up against the straight edge. Can't you just buy a bit of straight track? No. The reason okay. is not that in the model, a toy train set, like a Hallby train set, something like that, um, the set piece curves and set straights. Right. So you can build a circle or you can build an oval, but you can't easily build a track that flows with the ground. Now, do these tracks just clip together? Because I've noticed at some points around here there are little gaps. Yes, <coughs> and we need gaps for expansion. I mean, it's beginning to, the sun is beginning to shine at last. Oh, right, so... Uh, so these, yeah. um, as you probably can see, have got rivets on the outside moulded. Yeah. They go on the outside, so they slide in there like that. Yeah. That's one. Yeah. And then this one, Goes again, on with the rivets well. outside, will come onto this side here. Yeah. What, we'd, what we do is we just push the tracks together now, but don't worry about the expansion gap at this point. Right. We can put that in afterwards. When, when, should, I, when should I worry about it? You've got me very worried about well, it. Well, now, no, the main thing is to get the alignment right first. Right. Go to the nearest trammel yeah. and just very lightly yeah. tap in a pin. Now, well, how comes you're tapping in at the side and not in the middle of these sleepers? Uh, because we don't want the sleeper to curl. If you tap in the middle yeah. and fix in the middle, in the sun, these very thin scale sleepers will start to go like a banana. Oh, right. And if that happens, the line will go out of gauge. Yeah, you don't want that. So all we do is we drive in um, the odd pin. Yeah just to get it approximately straight, making yeah. sure that it's tight against the aluminium there, yeah. and particularly at the end. Right. Oh, so Moving our sleepers up as we go, so we'll now take our carriage off and yeah. move that to there. Yeah. Now, if, uh, if for realism I wanted to put some ballast on, would I do all this first yes. and then put the ballast on and, yeah. and you, dust you, it off? You could. It's just an effect, is it? Um, on a big railway like this, it's a very expensive and tedious operation. And it will also allow, under these trees, algae and moss to accumulate right. and you'll have much trouble. So when you're satisfied with the track, don't run on anything because it's going to foul these pins. Yeah. You then get the proper track laying pins and pin those in and drive them into this depth 
when you're satisfied it's straight. Now this may sound very fussy, but some of these gauge one engines move at a speed. Right. And you can be looking at an engine worth two and a half thousand pounds, right. hauling about two thousand pounds worth of coaches. Right. The track has got to be spot on. Uh, well, exactly like the real thing. Exactly seemingly. like if the real thing. If you're going at 125 yes. miles an hour yep. on a real yes. railway, yes. There's, there can be no, nothing out of shape, can no, there? And no. The same applies here as well. Track lane, it's easy peasy. It's a doddle. Don't believe it. It can take you ages. This bit here was all all right, but as soon as we hit the station area, points, very fiddly, fitting little sections of track in there. And if you're like me and you demand your track wiggling all over the place, then it can take you hours. All of that took half a day to do. And this bit here is proving especially difficult. And that's really because we're coming off a nice bit of straight here on this bridge and immediately going to a very sharp curve through a tunnel. So not only is the sharpness of this curve a problem, uh, but we need to observe our loading gauge as we go through the tunnel. The loading gauge, of course, is the clearance that you have between the train and the tunnel, and we need to allow enough to get the train through. So, what have we got in our armoury to tackle this problem? Well, our first thing that we have is a piece of flexible track, and this is flexible track. It's made of brass rails here, and then moulded plastic sleepers, which are all held together by these little bits of plastic here. Now, flexible track, as its name suggests, is flexible, but in this case, we need a little bit more. So the first thing to do is just to ease it. And the best place to ease it is around your stomach, okay? Don't do it around your knee like that because you'll create a point in the track, which is the last thing you need for a smooth running operation. Just ease it a little bit. And then on your inside curve, which in this case is this here, snip away at the plastic thus. It doesn't need to come out, but it does need to be able to move. Now that's quite a long job, and it's a matter of just working your way through the whole of this particular rail until it's done. And this just allows you even more flexibility on the inside. And this is all truly absorbing, but as you can see, the actual process involved is quite time consuming. So in the best traditions of television, <laughs> here's one I prepared earlier. So that's our flexible track ready for the job in hand. Obviously, flexible track, when you flex it one way or the other, the inner rail is now too long for that curve, so you need to cut it down to size. If you've got a whole big long curve, you wouldn't need to do it for a while. But I've finally reached the stage on this curve of having to saw down, and I'll tell you what, this brass is not the easiest stuff to get through. My name's Graham Harding and I've been muddling this particular line for the last almost 10 years. The railway's called the Montezuma Lumber Company uh, and the actual railroad itself is called the Dolores and Paradox. The geared locomotives that were made for the logging industry uh, were three types. Shays, Climaxes and Heislers. And the ones we're going to look at today are the Shays. They were developed by Ephraim Shea, who was a logger, and he designed this engine, which instead of having cylinders driving directly onto the wheels, had cylinders on the right-hand side of the engine driving a prop shaft, which was geared onto the wheels. So the number of rotations that you got for the prop shaft and the cylinders was far greater than for the wheels. And this meant that they had a great deal of power, but of course would only run at relatively low speeds. The line is 750 feet long on the main line, with a number of passing loops, one at the bottom and one at the top. 
The lower part of the line is modelled as a sawmill with the associated buildings. The upper end of the lime has a logging camp, uh, which is where the other passing siding goes through. It's single track. Uh, all the points are hand turned, so you actually change them as you go. The line is somewhat unusual in that it is built uh, as a logging line with trestle bridges and they were built by Jimmy Martin up in Burnt Island and he, he built these out of redwood planks. He actually got redwood planks and sawed them into strips. I never in my wildest dreams thought that one day I'd be appearing on the television screen talking about ballast. But I am, and I'm not doing it on my own. I'm doing it with David Pratt here, our serious consultant. It's uh, pretty important stuff, ballast, isn't it? Yeah, it holds the track in place. Yeah, it's those stones that you see in between the sleepers of any railway. Mm -hmm. And yet, in garden railway circles, there's a debate as to whether you should have ballast or not. Well, we're interested in modelling, aren't we? So whatever nuisances and disadvantages there are to ballast, mm -hmm. um, well, we're going to have to put up with them and face them, aren't we? Aren't yeah. we? So, uh, right, let's start with the different sorts of ballast that we could have mm -hmm. on this railway. You fancy, this is you know, the sort of stuff that you've been using for years now, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, that's here? fish tank gravel. And it's about the right scale. It's about two millimetres in size. The only thing I would say, David, is it's not sharp. Mm. And, uh, it's true. Uh, you know, that, that to me just gives it a slightly wrong appearance. Mm -hmm. Loath though I am to disagree with you. Yeah, it's up to you. I did go up to the garden centre yesterday and found myself some of this. Mm. Now, this is horticultural grit. Okay, I guess you use this around your flower beds or something. Mm. Mm. Um, it's slightly over scale, I admit, mm -hmm. but it has that sharpness about it. And we've laid a little bit down here on the railway just yeah, to act as a comparison. Um, this is David's here. It looks all right. Mm -hmm. If I were a passing bird, I'd think that looked like bird seed. Yes, you would. Uh, and this is mine here. Mm -hmm. um, it's sharp, slightly over scale, but I think it looks all right. Okay. Okay. We'll so go with that then. We'll go with that. Now then, David. Fixing ballast. Mm. You're about to reveal a little trade secret to us, aren't you? Yeah, I, I mean, the way I've ended up with over the last, what, 15, 16 years is to mix my ballast yeah. with rapid setting cement. Right. Uh, rapid setting cement isn't quite like ordinary cement. Yeah. It's a sort of resin. Right. And I mix the two together. Yeah and then it sets nice and hard and I've had railway lines that have sat there for 10 years. What sort of mix do you think I should give it? That was a bag of that. I would think a couple of cupfuls. If you're worried about expense by the way, horticultural grit, that bag cost me £1.25. So there's one of those. Yeah. Another one? Yeah. And I would tip the whole bucket load down in the middle there. Yeah. That'll do you. Shouldn't really put your hands into the cement of course, you're going to go all wrinkly. Okay and tip the whole bucket load down in the middle. Okay, here we go then. Across the tracks? Just go along here, yeah, everywhere. Yeah, yeah, go on, just go down. More, all of it, that's it, go back, the whole lot. That'll do us, that's it. Right, okay. Now, I mean, this just happens to be a brush that I had handy, but a paintbrush will do, right. ordinary domestic paintbrush. Right. Yeah? And then just brush it around in the track. Now, um, some people use glue, don't they? Yeah. But you're not a big fan of that, are you? Not really. I mean, I find this works. It lasts 10 years. I don't need to change it. The glue goes white. But in people there. do use PVA, and yeah. PVA goes white in the rain. Um, there are so many methods of doing anything in garden railways, and most people end up with their own little uh, way of doing something anyway. Right. By tomorrow morning, though, this will be set hard or we can spray it with water now. Right. If we're in a hurry. Right. And that's why we use quick setting mortar as well, that it will set very quick. My name is Brian Spinks and this is the Glen Valley Tramway. We've been up here about uh, with, with, with the railway 
about 10 or 11 years. And it was just, it was made as a fairly simple thing. It was steam, because I like steam. And I had both steam and uh, battery. And the main aim of the whole setup has been a method of atmosphere, which is what I've always wanted. And I decided that I would build the castle. And the castle is uh, being uh, somewhat bashed up by Oliver Cromwell. Well, prior to Brian's illness, it's Brian's hobby, and I've always helped him with it, with the horticultural side of it. So as he's not been able to do it, I've tried to keep it going for him. And she's even got the trains going, and I couldn't even do that. Brian has steam engines, but um, I don't know how to steam them up myself. So we just run the little battery operated ones at the moment. Since taking it over, I've really enjoyed doing it myself. And he really enjoys to sit in the summer house opposite and look at it. and clear last bit of ballasting in that section anyway there was a bit of debate about whether to put ballast on these bridges or not david said good railway practice would say not i said i wanted it i cried a little bit threw a tantrum i must admit stamped my feet and won my own way it's my railway hey but we did agree about this these are the points and we've left those unballasted to make sure that they all work correctly but at last, we've got some rolling stock out on the line. Hey, <laughs> I've been using this wagon, which is my widest one and highest one as it is, to check all the loading gauges to make sure it fits through all the tunnels, cuttings and uh, through all the curves. And it does, I'm glad to say. So the next step is to get some locos out on the line. Hey, see you on the next one. Bye.